Lex Gillette, it's an absolute pleasure, my friend, to have you join me. I can't tell you the, the thrill I have. Um, I, I certainly know about you, but why don't you go ahead and if you could give us a quick background on you for our listeners. Yes, thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it and, and really glad to be with you today. I am Lex Gillette. I am a four-time Paralympic medalist and world champion in the long jump for totally blind athletes. And I'm actually here at the Olympic Training Center because I'm training for the upcoming Tokyo Paralympic Games. So I'm really excited about that. What are we, 80, 81, 82 days away? I think we are, what are we, 82? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, 82 days away, I want to say. Coming right up, obviously. So uh, with, with that said, can you help me understand, like, what is a day in the life of uh, an Olympic athlete? I mean, it's certainly <laughs> nothing that I know about, but I'd love to know what the, what the regimen and what the schedule looks like. There's a lot. There's a lot. We are Monday through Friday right now with training and each day kind of dictates how many hours you're out there. So on the harder days, we're out there two and a half, three hours, give or take. And that includes a two a day session. You have a session that's on the track where we're doing a lot of different sprinting drills and we're actually sprinting and working on literally jumping, flying through the air. And then the second session would would be a, a weight room session. So you're working on getting that, that strength so that you can have the speed and power to be able to run as fast as possible and jump as far as possible. And um, since we are 82 days away, once we get a little closer to the games, things will naturally taper down and you wanna make sure that you're giving your body the adequate amount of time to, to rest and recover so that you can be sharp and, and in top peak shape to, to have a great performance in Tokyo. I've been reading, you know, uh, almost every day about talks about it still being canceled. Is, is that a concern you have? I mean, you do you have inside information as to what you think is actually going to happen? You know what? There is no real insider information. The info, the info that we have is the, the games is going to happen. And as an athlete, you put so much sweat and energy and effort into representing your country and going to participate in the games you really just have to to have some some strong armor built up around <laughs> the results and, and things that are going on because it can make you feel it can make you feel a little, a little discouraged at times and make you feel like the future is uncertain but at this time last year it was it was even worse and so I count the the space that we are in right now as a, as a blessing is it's going to happen as we know I'm going to continue to work as hard as possible. We're 82 days away. And the only thing I the only thing I can do is control what I can control. And that's to get out here, work as hard as possible and, and get ready to, to travel to Tokyo in, in 82 days or less. I, I didn't even realize with this, obviously, with the Paralympics being delayed and the Olympics being delayed a year, you've basically had to train for an additional year for all of this. I mean, that, that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's you can look at it two different ways, right? You have maybe you have the athletes who were planning on retiring in 2020. And so they might be thinking that, oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta wait another 365 days. You also may have the perspective of the athlete who they might have been, they might have had an injury, right? And so the 365 days gives them an opportunity to heal and, and really get back to the position that they were prior to that injury. So I think it just, you know, it, it, it differs from athlete to athlete. I know as challenging as it was in the beginning, I just looked at it as an opportunity to really work on some things that, that needed to be tightened up areas where I needed to get stronger and more confident in. And uh, yeah, and, and it's paying off. We've had some great competitions over the past few months here in the Southern California area. And, uh, and it's, it's really allowed me the opportunity to work on some things and, and get myself in a really good space. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And, and hats off to you for all the training and everything you're doing. And uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, could you give us uh, the story? And, and I know you touch on this in your full keynote, obviously, but can you give just a, a, a quick story on how actually you did, uh, unfortunately, lose your, lose your eyesight? I am, so I'm from North Carolina and I was born with sight. I could see well up until I was eight years old. For me, it was literally coming home from school, doing my homework, 
playing outside with friends that night as I was getting ready for bed, I started to notice that things were looking blurred, looking faint. And that prompted me to tell my mom, we didn't really know what the issue was. We, we did the whole clean your eyes out with water uh, type situation. Hopefully uh, that, that would clear out any type of maybe dirt or, or something that might have get, gotten lodged into my eyes from playing outside earlier in the day. That didn't work. So we went to the doctors and after an examination, they said I needed to have an emergency operation because I was suffering from wow. retinal detachments. Um, and that just that led to a string of, of multiple operations that one year that I was that I was eight years old, 10 to be exact. And after the last one, doctors said that there was nothing else they could do to help my sight. And they said that I would eventually become blind. So uh, from there, it was go home, <laughs> do your homework, Jeez. play outside with yeah. friends at night, go to sleep. And, and you wake up each morning seeing a little less of what you do the day before until one day I woke up and, and I couldn't see anything. Wow, that, that is, yeah, that's unbelievable. Um, and, and so sorry to hear this. Obviously, you've, you've made it into a blessing, like you say. But, but so how long, how long was the process from you, you first realized this at eight? How long, uh, how many years was it until you totally couldn't see anything? I would say, so it was a gradual decrease and it happened fairly, fairly quickly. I would say over that next six months. Oh, wow. It was a gradual, yeah, it was a gradual decrease. So by the time I was nine years old, I really couldn't, I couldn't make out much of anything. I could tell you when it was, if it was sunny outside, if it was nighttime, maybe a vague shadow or two here and there, but nothing nothing that was crisp or clear nothing of that of that matter so um yeah i mean it, it was a wow. it, it happened really quickly which which really meant that we had to transition uh pretty pretty rapidly speaking of that how was that on your family i mean um obviously it's it's got to be quite an adjustment for them as well yeah well you know my mom is really she's a strong person and so she gave me that opportunity to really grieve and, and work through those emotions and things that you feel because you go through something that that traumatic you you deal with the 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 the, the fear and sure. the you know the anger at times and being sad and and even the uncertainty of you know, once you could see the world and now you can't see anything yeah. at all so working through those things and then just learning how to use your other senses and learning how to or use your hearing and your, your sense of feel and touch and, and using your memory. And, and I learned all of those things from her, my mom, her biggest goal for me was she just wanted me to be self-sufficient and be hmm. independent and be able to survive on my own. So yeah, she, you know, I had to do chores. I had to get good grades on my homework and, learn how to use, uh, read Braille and to use a cane so I can navigate on my own. And, and somewhere along the road, a few years later, I, I was introduced to, uh, to adaptive sports and recreation. And that led me to track and field. <laughs> I was going to ask you how that, how, how did you get started in that? So was it, it, it was that, uh, did you call, I'm sorry, adaptive sports? Okay. Oh, and so it, oh. it was that, it was a one person in particular that got you started in track and field? Yeah, so once I, my mom's side of the family is the athletic side. So I get the athletic genes from them. It's not, it was nothing for us to, my grandmother has a really big backyard. And so at the time when I could see, it was nothing for my family to get out yeah. there, play kickball, play, you know, any type of just pick up, you know, pick up games. Sure. And, um, and, and so I was naturally an athletic kid. Once I had been introduced to other adapted sports like beat baseball, which is an adapted form of, of baseball for the blind, I yeah, learned awesome. about ball. Yeah, and and I learned about track and field in high school through a physical fitness test. I had a teacher who used to go to PE class with me. My mom kept me in public school, so all I was used to was being around other sighted peers, but I had a teacher of the visually impaired who accompanied me to make sure that the environment was as, as inclusive as, as possible and making sure. sure that I participated alongside my sighted peers. And so we had a physical fitness test one day. We had to do a number of different activities. One of those activities was standing long jump, and I just so happened to wow. be really good at, at that. One of the, the best in the school. 
And from there, my teacher, Brian Whitmer, had told me about the Paralympics. And it's like, you can, you can travel the world, and you can break records, and you can win medals. And you tell a 14-year-old kid those types of things, it's like, all right, well, <laughs> where do I sign up? And um, from there, I had him to uh, you know, help me learn about the sport, uh, specifically long jump. And he was the one that, that helped me learn that, that strategy of, all right, Lex, I'm going to stand at this takeoff point, this takeoff mm -hmm. point, I'm going to clap and yell, straight, 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 so you know which direction to run. I want you to run as straight as possible, as fast as possible to the sound of my voice and at the appropriate step, I want you to, to jump. And uh, wow. we, we honed that down. And the rest, as they say, is <laughs> history. Do, do you count? So do you know the exact number of steps, like from where you start? Is it, And I'll just like, is it 16 or is it 20? Or you know exactly when you're going to hit that board and you're going to go flying through the air. Yep. So this is the thing, whether you are sighted or not as a long jumper, triple jumper, high jumper, pole vaulter, you know how many steps it takes for you to cover your your specific runway approach. So for me, I take 16 strides that that usually covers around 115 feet, give or take. Wow. So I'm standing that far away from my guide who's yelling as loud as possible and clapping. And we work on it every day. That's the, you know, that's the point of, of, of training, right? You work on it and get to the point where, uh, where I am now, which is a lot of it is muscle memory. So I, I may not count those strides in my head like I did you know, 12, 13 years ago. And um, you work on it, work on it, work at it so much that it becomes muscle memory. And I know that on my 16th stride, which will be my, my 16th step will be my left wow. foot then I jump and, and soar through the air. And, and most times I land in this <laughs> land in the sand pit. <laughs> 115 feet. I think it's yeah. safe to say it would take me at least 40 strides to hit 150. <laughs> that, you know that, what? That 115 feet takes me a little less than four seconds to cover. So you really wow. have to be on your A game, boom, 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 making sure that you're listening to your guide and following the sound that person's voice because there's not a lot of time or room for error so so what are your you mentioned four time i'm sorry four time uh medalist what what, what are your goals for for the upcoming paralympics want to win gold that's that's oh. always the goal is to win the gold medal I've, for, I've been fortunate enough to participate in four paralympic games and that's the only thing that i haven't achieved to this point, I haven't gotten that elusive gold medal. So I'm really wow. excited about that. And, and it makes it exciting because you have something still to shoot for and something to go after. So it makes it a lot of fun and, and challenging at the same time. But challenges are what have helped me to overcoming those challenges are what have helped me to get to this point. So training is going good. Competition is looking good. I need to get out there and, and, and execute when the time calls for it. And uh, yeah, I want to be on that podium this summer, hearing that national anthem, having oh my another gosh. place around my neck. I'm getting goosebumps, my friend. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> uh, I, I know you do obviously a lot of speaking. Help me just quickly before we uh, I let you go. Help me um, understand and the people listening and watching this understand how all this uh, ties in and correlates with your keynote. You know what? I have a, a slogan and the slogan is no need for sight when you have a vision. And we're here. I'm here at the Olympic Training Center, as I mentioned earlier. This is where I train on a daily basis. And I'll, I'll give you this this brief story really quickly. Last Please. year around this time in, in March, April, March specifically, we were here training and the excitement is at an all time high. And people <laughs> are really you know, you're like, oh, my gosh, we're about to go to the games. We're going to be on this plane. We're going to Tokyo. For me, I was that that was I was that athlete. And so I was scheduled to compete on the first day of track and field evening session, bright lights. And wow, you're thinking to yourself, all right, I have this opportunity on the first day of competition to win this gold medal. And then you get the news of the games being postponed and potentially canceled. That was really, that was challenging. Uh, that was definitely some, some tough news. And then you start to pop up with positive COVID-19 tests within the group. 
So now we wow. are, we're having to get where we, we get locked down. The facility closes. We have to quarantine. At one point, I'm in my room and 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 having to 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 have food delivered to the room because nobody can get outside. So for a period of time, you're not able to do that one thing that you love to do so much. That one thing that you tr that you've trained for four years to have this opportunity to compete this one moment in time in in Tokyo, and that was really tough. For, for a couple, I'm gonna say a month and a half, that was the environment. We couldn't train, we couldn't do anything. And then eventually we were able to, to get back out and start moving around. However, we were still under uh, uh, restrictions in the sense of, you know, you can't, you can't be more than, uh, I'm sorry, less than six feet away from someone. Now, although I have my guide who's clapping and yelling at that long jump area, when I'm doing my runs in practice, those hundred meter repeats or all of those drills, he's literally right next to me. Sure. So I couldn't, I couldn't train with him. Taking it back to no need for sight when you have a vision, it's not the sight that determines our success, it's that ability to, to see a vision and to figure out a plan, do everything in your power to bring that into fruition. So what did I do? I, I began to get up and go down to the track by myself at like 6.15, 6.30 in the morning. I go down there with my, my smartphone and my, my Bluetooth speaker. And I'll come back to that in a second. So there's a portion on the track where the track and the grass meet. So I, I can feel that under my, under my shoes, there's a different texture between the, the grass and the track. I mark that as my, my starting point. So what I did is from that starting point, I have my cane in my hand and I'm sliding it from left to right, left to right, left to right as I walk forward down the track. So wow. I'm making sure that there aren't any starting blocks, no, no hurdles or any type of obstacles that would create a, you know, an opportunity for me to get injured. About 30 meters forward, I stop and I take my smartphone. I turn on like, I don't know, like Drake radio or something. And I connect, <laughs> I connect the, 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 the Pandora, the phone to the Bluetooth speaker. And I turn the speaker up to a good volume. And I, decided that, all right, this is going to be my end point, my finish line. So even though I wasn't able to train with my guide, now I had this 30 meter space where I could do those high knees and I could do those butt kicks and I could do some accelerations and I could do that with the confidence of knowing that I wasn't going to trip over anything. I wasn't going to, to twist an ankle or, or anything like that. And even though it wasn't the same level of training that I was used to doing with my guide, it was allowing me to stay above float and, and allowing yeah. me to, to stay in some sort of shape so that when, when they did give us permission to get back out and, and I would actually be able to train with him in the fashion that I was used to, that I wouldn't be starting from ground zero. And so when you think about the, the vision, for me right now is going to Tokyo and winning that gold medal. And I wasn't going to allow the, the, you know, the site or the current situation to impede that progress. So I, th I think that, you know, when people hear that mantra, no need for sight, when you have a vision, they may think about it from a, okay, well, this, this only relates to someone who's blind or visually impaired, when in fact, it's, it's not. I think that it resonates for all of us because it truly isn't the sight that determines our success. It is our ability to see beyond the horizon, to see things before they exist, and to not only see those things and to believe those things, but to then develop a plan to achieve what that, that vision is and also connect with the appropriate people and go after that vision relentlessly and not allow any of the, the circumstances to, to hold us back. Lex, I love it. Thank you so much for joining me, my friend. No need for sight when you, when you have a vision. I couldn't agree with you more. I am super excited to watch you in 82 days and I wish you the best of luck and we'll all be cheering for you. And, uh, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it.